chapter 5, if you have a Bible, turn there, the gospel of Mark chapter 5, and I pray that this will minister to those present and those who will maybe watch this uh, in the future. You know, there's so many breakthroughs uh, in science. You know, Daniel prophesied about the day and hour in which you live. He says, knowledge will increase. You know, in our phone, how many have a smartphone? In that little device, right there is more information and more knowledge than the first computer of just decades ago. Right. And they get stronger, faster, on and on it goes. The things that we see taking place today is mind-blowing. And Daniel had said, you're going to see this knowledge increasing and, and breakthrough in medicine. But yet, in spite of all these advancements... Uh, there are still so many people who cannot find a cure or a remedy to their situation. Whatever it might be, they're looking for an answer. They're taking medication. They're going to therapy. They're lying on a couch talking to somebody, and they walk out the same. And they're wondering, how come 
I cannot be free. How can I cannot find no relief? Uh, you look at the statistics and, and it's ever increasing. Depression and suicide are rapidly on the rise. Domestic violence is at all time high. Uh, uh, the opioid epidemic, uh, amen, in our nation is be, uh, uh, over the roof. Uh, and you see, amen, in light of all these little uh, uh, things that people are wrestling, the pharmaceutical companies are making big money because the demand never stops uh, for pain relievers, uh, for psych meds, uh, to appease the pain, the depression, the anxiety, all these things that people are feeling. They want some relief and they can't find it. Yeah. And in, in the midst of all this chaos, uh, the one thing that can help them is being pushed to the side. Moral truth and absolutes, especially when it comes to God, work, God's word, are being challenged, pushed into the corner, trying to get out of the public square. We don't want to hear what you got to say. We don't want to hear what the Bible says. And, and in fact, they're in the lines of secularism, socialism, liberalism, and all these things. And, and especially the demonic efforts, amen, to push a Amen. God and his word out of the public setting and demanding public uh, to come uh, to come into compliance uh, with this hell bent agenda to bring people to where they just believe everything that's out there. It's amazing to me that nobody calls this into question. Amen. Because Amen. all this uh, I see over the last few years, especially more and more people are finding themselves lost, isolated. In darkness, in depression, desperately needing answers, and many people have nowhere to turn. Mm -hmm. And they just ain't and isolate themselves, and they're wondering, is there any hope for me? And there is only one answer, yeah. and that is Jesus. Yeah. He is the only one who can break the chains that hold you bound, the Break the chains that got you depressed, feeling like nobody cares about you. You're in gloom and doom everywhere you turn. It seems like you have no friends. Nobody cares about you. And you're walking around and you're, and you're bearing the reproach in your heart. You might not show everybody, but there are people all over the place like this who need Jesus. Amen. I want to minister a sermon that I've entitled The Chain Breaker. Because that's who he is. I didn't come to church dressed in a suit. My first day in church, I was down a little bit with Brother Jason. I walked into church. I'd been up for three days on methamphetamines. Smoked a big old fat doobie. Carried a big old can of beer in my car as I rode to church that night. And I didn't know anything. I didn't think I could be free from the things I'd been doing since childhood. So to say, even preteen days when I discovered marijuana and cigarettes and pills, and alcohol, I didn't think I could change. I just thought it was a way of my life. And if you didn't like it, I didn't care. I used to publicly smoke marijuana before it was fashionably, you know, you could have your little medical card. I was dumb enough to vote for that back in the day. They would have it on the ballot. But I tell you, when I walked into the church that night, Jesus met me. Amen. And he broke the chains. Amen. I tell people to this day, he did what the Marine Corps could not do. Amen. He did what the, the police couldn't do. Amen. He did what the judge tried to threaten me about. He did what my mama wished could, she could have done. In one encounter with Jesus, I was transformed. Yes. Amen. I want to read this text. Mark chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1. This is a powerful story. Jesus not only doing something here, he's demonstrating to everyone who would read the gospel and especially to those who were, who were with him at the time, the mission of Jesus Christ. He said, then they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. When he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him. Not even with chains, because he had often been bound in, with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles were broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. Always night and day, he was in the mountains, in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When Jesus 
When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him and cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Yeah, ain't that interesting? Demons can't do anything without permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. The herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. They were afraid. And those who saw told them how it had happened to him, who had been demon-possessed, and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Yeah. Amen. Very powerful, powerful story of deliverance. Amen. Radical change in a man's life who had no power in himself to change. I want to consider those on the other side. When you read in the Gospels, you'll read the account of Matthew, who is a, who is a, a Jewish man. And he is writing from the perspective of a Jewish mindset. And so I'm so glad the Gospels are harmonious. In other words, they go together, but they say things from a different viewpoint. You know, John has his gospel, and he's uh, revealing the Son of God, the love of God, amen, and, the, and all these things. Uh, Luke is a, an excellent recorder of history, and he's a doctor. He has got that mindset, and so he's meticulous in his writing. And Matthew, he's coming with this, uh, this mindset of the Jew, and he's led by the Spirit to write his gospel. And he, in his writings, you can see the, the viewpoint of, uh, of the Jewish mindset that day concerning those who were demoniacs, those who were bound and out of control. He saw them, like others did, as a public nuisance. These uh, demoniacs would often gather into the highways and byways of of the areas, you know, out in the wilderness because no one wanted them in the public setting. And they would uh, wreak havoc on travelers going in and out of the cities doing business, rip them off, destroy things. And so they looked at these people and considered them completely lost and without hope. And a lot of these, uh, these crazies would render the roads impassable at times. And so Matthew, he's writing from this perspective and he's Seeing these, especially who were Gentiles and in this kind of condition, as not worth reaching. There was something in him, in these people, an inward prejudice creating a, a, a little twist or a jaundiced view of people in need, especially those who were not like them. That's why Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. He had to deal with them and their mindset. You get them to think there's people out there who need the love of God. Yes. But Mark's gospel, he shows us Jesus going out of the way in every kind of condition to reach, amen, those who are the worst of the worst. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad he did. Amen. Oh, man, I'm so glad he did. He did the same thing in, in John chapter 4 when he was uh, showing his disciples how he said in the scripture that he needed to go through Samaria. 
Unbeknownst to the disciples who were with him, there was a woman. There was going to be a divine encounter. Just like tonight, there could be a divine encounter. Jesus could meet you at your low point. And you could walk away changed by the power of God. He goes there. There's a woman. She's coming at a different hour of the day. Not when most women come. He's coming at a, she's coming at a time because she's filled with shame because of her relationship problems. The, her life's in shambles. And she's uh, shacking up with a man. And on and on the story goes. But Jesus is missing ministry to her, offering her living water that will never cause her to thirst again because there's always somebody looking something that will satisfy the soul. They're looking in a bottle. They're looking in a pill. They're looking in a boyfriend or a girlfriend. They're looking on a, online, addicted to the dopamine levels that come and even get them all excited because they're looking at something that causes a rush, but they can never find what they're looking for. Yeah. And so here's this woman. She has an encounter. She walks away and she gets all the men of the city to come. It's a glorious, glorious scene that takes place as he's ministering to a lady who's down and out and without hope. And Jesus challenges the disciples at the end of that particular incident because they come and they're baffled that he's talking to a woman, a Samaritan woman of all. And he tells them, don't say four months comes the harvest. He says, lift your eyes and look. Behold, the harvest is already ready. There are people all around here who are hurting, who are isolated, who are lonely, who are desperate. And I have to ask this question, and this is not an accusation, it's simply a question. You can answer it on your own, in your own heart. Uh, but where are your eyes focused, especially when it comes to the harvest field? Do you not care for those who are on the other side? You know, I know this is a small community, but I can guarantee that in a small community of uh, Silver City, New Mexico, there is a bad side of town. Amen. That's where all the, you know, that's where you go get your fix. That's where the, you know, the drunks hang out. That's where the crazy party people hang out. The meth heads, the people who smoke crack. And I'm on the list goes. Because there's always that kind of area, amen, where people are living. People, amen, that are in abusive relationships. People that are suicidal. People that are depressed. Uh, people that you might think unreachable because they've gone so far in the direction of sin. They seem just out of touch. And sometimes you think, ah, if God wants them saved, he'll save them. Mm -hmm. I want to consider those among the tombs. Because there are countless souls who are hurting both inside and out. Hurting themselves and those that love them. They have no idea how they've gotten so bad. And sometimes, sadly, they don't even see it for what it is. They're blind to their own, you know, depraved heart, mind, or their own hatred, their own self, uh, amen, infliction of pain and everything else they're doing. They're out of control. They're headed for destruction. And they think, for the most part, like I did, that's just the way I am. That's just the way it is. But, you know, they factor out or they leave out the thing that is most important to understand. But we don't understand it when we are living in the tombs. Is that is sin is destroying us. We never, ever call it sin. We first think of, of, of just saying, I've got a bad shot in life. I've got, it's always somebody else's fault. It's that person. They done me wrong. I came from a broken home. I've got a dysfunctional family. On and on the list goes, but we never see it. Uh, for sin. Preach. The Bible says the wage of sin is death. When I came to church, I can tell you, I was burnt out. I had been to the point in my life where I had figured I'm going to be dead by the time I'm 25 years old. I had given up. I was living pedal to the metal, headed for hell. I didn't care who I hurt. I had no natural affections. I, I love my mom, but I didn't really, you know, if she died, I probably wouldn't have shed a tear. That's how far I'd gone down that road. There are lots of people just like that. They think, oh, well, that's just the way it is. Jesus said, whoever commits a sin is a slave to sin. What that means is if you relinquish control to a very hard taskmaster, you relinquish control of your life and sin begins to work and destroy and bring death and destruction Inside, outside, relationships, everything falls apart because you have no control. Sin is in control. 
And see, they don't want to tell you that on the national media. You know what the problem of America is? There's a bunch of lost sinners that need Jesus. That's the last thing they're going to say. They're going to say, you know what you need? You need another prescription. You need to read a good book. You need to get out of the environment and change somewhere else. No, you can take the sin out of a place and you know what? The sin's going to follow him wherever he goes. What starts off seemingly harmless takes people further and further and further down the road so they end up in some cases hurting themselves like this man, cutting himself, wanting to inflict harm, suicidal, desperate, have no answers. I, I've got to, you know, I was drinking myself to death. I was uh, partying myself to death. I didn't care what was going to happen. All that because sin was running its course. People become tormented in their soul. Bound in deep, dark, ugly places. Maybe even some here tonight, you don't even want to open up and share how far you've gone down that road. Amen. We're all good at putting up the fronts. We're all good at hiding behind the, what we think is the good part. And we keep that deep, dark, secret part of our lives hidden. The Bible says that just as Jesus was getting out of the boat, a man with an unclean spirit came from the tombs and met him. He lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For his hands and feet had often been bound with chains and shackles, but he had torn the chains apart and broken the shackles in pieces. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Let me tell you, listen to me. Yeah, I, I can identify with that man. Yes, amen. I can relate to that man. Because there was a time in my life when no one could subdue me. I was sharing a little bit of a testimony this uh, morning with Pastor about uh, how I treated a former police officer. But you know what? It's just not there. There's all kinds of things. I remember one time waking up with a case of beer next to me at this lake. Snapped out because I used to go into one of those blackout drunks, you know. I could function two, three days, didn't know where I was at, getting fights, beat people up, and do all kinds of damage, and then wake up. Uh, where am I? I remember waking up one time, and the guys that I had ended up with, they said, Man, you was out your mind. It took three of us to tie you up and hold you down in that car because you're going to kill people. I really? I didn't know. No one could tame him, hurting himself. Cutting himself, wandering around with no answers. See, man is always trying to subdue sin. In this picture, it's shackles and chains. But let me tell you, that's the programs of society today. They don't work. Hello. Amen. Praise the Lord. I just making sure this is on. They might work a little, but they aren't the answer. They are not the answer. See, I was ordered by the court system and even in the Marine Corps to go to the Alcohol Treatment and Alcoholics Anonymous over the years. Several drunk drivings and probably way more than I should have got caught. Way more because I always drove drunk. I was always over the limit. There wasn't a day in my life probably that I was not over the limit. And so you think about that as I'm driving around, and then they tell me, you need to go to AA. I would go to AA classes, and at break time, go to my car, suck down a beer, smoke a joint, go back and listen and talk some more. It's just so they could sign my little thing and say I was there. Go back. It wasn't working. I wasn't influenced by people talking about how they're still an alcoholic. I said, well, what good does it do if you're still an alcoholic? And so I was in those kind of meetings, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, and all these other things, uh, trying to subdue sin with the program, trying to sue. I remember being in jail. You ever been in jail? <laughs> Behind bars? They're trying to tell you how to change, and you're just looking at it like, I remember they subdued me, the nice deputies there in California. Because the deputy took my hand and he wanted to take my thumbprint, you know, for the record. And, you know, I already knew I had a record. And so he grabbed my hand kind of forcefully and he 
put it on me. He's kind of built, guy, strong guy, and I took my hand back. And it's before he beat, began to beat me with uh, into a pulp. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, you think you learn. I stood up and I looked at the deputy and I said, I'm going to remember you when I see you on the street. I'm going to get you. I was out of my mind. Out of my mind. Uh, things couldn't change in my life. I've been with those uh, who have walked. In, 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 I've seen some deep, dark uh, signs of sin and wickedness. I don't even like talking about some of the things I've been around. I've been face to face with hell's angels, uh, vagos in California. I've been dealing drugs with people. I remember going into the tombs of life uh, in places, uh, walking in with bags of methamphetamines uh, and cocaine uh, and watching amen, a mom walk around, little kids walk around in diapers. And I can feel even the sin of the, of the death and the stench of sin. I didn't know what it was. I'm in those kind of environments all the time. It was my life. See the freakiest people and the weirdest people and the cold-blooded killers looking across from you and you're looking at it and you're wondering, is this is just life? This is how it is. I've been down those roads and I'm telling you there's things that I've been involved in that have done that I am ashamed of to this day. I won't even tell people what I've done. Watching not only myself but others Inflicting damage to themselves. Hurting and destroying their life. Destroying my life. I was pastoring in the city of Fontana. And I remember I was at the pulpit. And I stopped and I told the church. Because I grew up in Fontana. You know what Fontana is famous for? It's the home of the Hell's Angels. It was a big meth place. Lots of drugs. And Sammy Hagar came from there. Like, who's that? He... Rock and roll. I can't drive 55, that guy. And so I'm pastoring in this city, and I stopped at the pulpit and I told the church. I said, before I got saved, across the street, behind that car wash, between the car wash and the duplex back there, there's a, a, an open area of asphalt. I said, a man pulled the gun on me. He was on drugs, I was on drugs. He had it right about a foot away from my chest as he was going to pull the trigger. I told the church, you know what I was thinking at that time? I wasn't thinking about Jesus. I was thinking, go ahead and pull the trigger, dude, because I'm going to come back and get you. I was deceived. I thought if I, I thought I was bigger than a bullet, I was going to come back and take over. I thought I was going to take over hell. That's how stupid I was. And then, yeah, and then I told the church, had that man pulled that trigger, I would have been in hell. And I wouldn't be in the church preaching the gospel today. So I've been in those places. I've been in those kind of situations over my life. And it's not always been good or pretty. The Bible says in verse 5, always night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs crying out and cutting himself with stones. So many people are out there in the darkest of tombs wandering through life aimlessly. No hope Dead inside, dead outside, just living a life of bondage, confusion, depression, hatred. All the list goes on and on. Nothing can change in their circumstance because they live amongst the dead. And I think about that. People bound, oppressed, tormented, fearful, anxious, always looking over their shoulder. Always worried about uh, you know, what's going to happen next. Uh, you know, what they need is an encounter like I had and like many others have with the true and the living God. Yeah. Let me tell you, if you've got pain inside or outside, uh, he is the pain taker. If you feel like you're lost, hopeless, and have no, no answers, let me tell you, he is the way maker. If you, if you feel like if you can't find your way home, you feel like you're sinking, let me tell you, my friend, he is a prison breaking savior. I mean, he can break the chains of that deep, dark dungeon of depression that you're in, and he can pull you out and give you life. Yeah. I'm telling you, if you've got chains, oh, my God is a chain breaker. I want to consider the one thing in this text that is not said, but it's so true. And that is encounter with the living word of God. When I walked into church that night, I was confronted with the gospel. The word of God being preached clearly at the altar call. 
And it convicted me. This man in the tombs here, he's not being preached to. Jesus, the Bible says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. And then it goes on to verse 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when Jesus stepped out of that boat and in on to the shore right there, the Word of God was coming to that place. And that man felt drawn to that man. He came running down that place and bowed down because Jesus is the living word of God. That's why when people go to church, they say, man, he was like preaching to me. <laughs> Hello. The Bible says in Hebrews, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two of the sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This is who Jesus is. He's the living word. It's like, amen, man, the man is preaching and you feel like, hey, man, he's talking to me. He's reading my mail. No, it's Jesus. Come on. He's the word of God. Amen. There's something about the word of God that makes impact wherever it goes. I am a firm believer in the clear cut gospel being preached because it was at that altar. When that altar went forward, man, it was like God is talking to you. He's nailing you. In my pride, in my, in, my, in my darkness, in my tomb that I was in, he was nailing me with words to the point where I said, man, maybe God brought me here for a reason. <laughs> See, God's word never returns void. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, Amen. so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God is the one that sends his word. Yes, he sends it through messengers, humans, sometimes frail, weak vessels, but he sends it anyways. So that means our witness, our outreach, our street preaching at times, it seems like nothing's happening. But let me tell you, something is always happening. Because God's word is going forth and, and it's going to hit the target uh, that God has aimed it for. It could be a passerby. It could be simply someone taking a flyer and you saying Jesus loves you. But that word will resonate in their heart. Amen. That's how powerful it is. Amen. You can be set free if you want to be free. Amen. No demon in hell can stop you. The Bible says when Jesus saw, or when he saw Jesus more, he ran and he worshipped him and he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high? I implore you by God not to torment me. That was a demon speaking. I think I was sharing with Pastor Edna the other day. My wife, my girlfriend at the time, you know, she was, you know, her grandma took her to church and so she had these Seeds planted in her, carried with her through the torment of her adolescence and teen years. And she always was hoping, and she knew the gospel just enough to always want to be in church, but not knowing how to get there. And she sat with me one night praying, trying to pray with me. And ended up actually getting me to respond to her and pray with her. We were up for a couple of days on meth. And as I'm praying, she says, then say in Jesus' name. And I could not say Jesus. Literally, my mind was blocked. I couldn't put that name on my lips. And you know, that's just a short end of the story. But God uh, was working to set me free. And I didn't even realize it because a simple Amen. testimony of my wife and the word of God that she just barely knew was enough to start to crack the hard shell. Enough to start to open things up. For God's spirit to work. Uh, you know, I've seen heroin addicts, meth addicts, people hooked on opioids and fentanyl and alcoholics set free by the power of God. Yes. Come on. I prayed for a man one time. I laid hands on him. He began to double over backwards. Uh, he reeked of alcohol. And then by the time I'm done praying, he, got, he looked at me like, what happened? I said, God just touched you, man. I prayed for another man. Spooky was his name. He could no longer, no longer ride a Harley because his knee was jacked up from a motor. Uh, he's a former H.A. His knee's all jacked up from a, a motorcycle accident. I prayed for him for deliverance at an altar as a disciple. As a disciple, I was praying for him. Man, God touched him. He fell over on the side. He's like, what happened, man? I said, God just touched him. He brought some more of his friends. And next week, he says, hey, man, can you 
can you pray for me again? I said, you got it, buddy. Man, let's believe God. Because if you want to be free, you can be free. I walked to the church high, stoned on Martha. I walked out completely sober. Sober. I walked out of the parking lot and I reached in my pocket and I threw the drugs away in the parking lot. Got home, I broke the scales, I, I flushed all my meth down the toilet. Uh, I even looked at my girlfriend and said, hey, we ain't living together, living like this. I, I'm going from the bedroom to the to the couch. Oh, hello, that's salvation right there. Because that's how powerful God changed my life. You want to be free, you can be free. Recently, this last year, you know, during the COVID you know, when our churches were you know, functioning but not functioning, service online and things, a little stricter in California and things like that. And I'd ask my pastor about a certain individual. And I pray for people. And I pray for everybody in my church by name. And I'm praying for this guy, and I hadn't seen him in a while, the dog on me. So I asked my pastor, hey, how's so and so? I said, I'm not good. I haven't seen him in a while. So i call, reach out, call, reach out. No answer, no, you're not answered. Then one day his ex-wife texts me, pastor, and another brother in the church. Says, you've got to come. And he, you know, I won't say his name, but he says he needs help. He's in the hospital. He's completely lost it. He's insane. They're going to take him to, you know, California. They call it Ward B. That's the mental ward. They're going to take him there because he's lost his mind. And so, you know, we're, so we're dialoguing. And, you know, we, okay, we're praying for him. And then she calls me about a week later. She goes, she goes I can't get a hold of Pastor. Can you, can you pray for him? I said, I'm right here at the hospital. Can you pray for him? There, he, he's out of his mind. He, does, he thinks he's in another place. I said, okay, put him on the phone. I'm going to talk to him. I began to take authority and say, in the name of Jesus, I break the power. I found out he was on fentanyl. He was killing himself with this stuff. I prayed for him. I broke. I said, in the name of Jesus, I, I bind you. I cast you out. You know, I found out some weeks later, he recovered. I started to follow up on him again, bring him to church. It all started. You know how it started? He hurt his back at work. He started getting, a, you know, they gave him some oxycotton. And so he started taking that for pain. And then he started liking it. And then. You find out somebody else hurt in the church. He goes, hey, you know what? I don't have, my back hurts. Can I, can you give me one of those prescription things? Nobody noticed at first. We're all good at hiding our bondage. And after a while, they started having him. People are dying from this. And he told me, I mean, I, you know, he's locked in. He's now being discipled. He's full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. He's set free, man. He's doing well. And he told me, he says, Mike, he says, your voice is the only thing I could hear. He said, I was at, they were going to take you to the hospital. They are going to keep you on drugs. They are just gone. He says, I, your voice is the only thing I heard. I said, praise God, man. Amen. Praise God. Because you know when people are in that condition, they need a power beyond themselves. Yeah. On, they need the one who can break the chains in their life. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm saying that because that is that fentanyl is killing people right now. Yeah. Yeah. And yet, people still struggle with vaping. Tobacco, sipping on a little alcohol from time to time, looking at a little porno from time to time. And they think, well, that's not really that bad. All oh, you, my friend, you are dabbling in things that are going to destroy your life. That's right, man. Fear, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, and all kinds of disorders out there. No problem for God. He's a chain breaker. Amen. He can break every form of sexual sin. Bondage, unbridled lust problems that's got you bound up. You say it'll never do again. You always go back and do it again. He can break the curse of you know fornication and promiscuity found constantly in those kind of struggles. Uh, Self gratification. I won't get into details, but you know what? You don't. You probably know what I'm talking about. Pornography, homosexuality, sexual dysphoria, you know, gender dysphoria, all kinds of things that are people are confused and they're shoving it in our throats, down our throats in this generation. Jesus can set you free. Amen. Amen. He can set you free. Come on. Amen. The Bible says, He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If this man, Hallelujah. bound by 2,000 demons, can be set free, yes. you can be free too. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to I close with this, and that is deliverance. 
with a purpose. God didn't save you or test you just to sit on the bench. Right. Hello. Yeah. Verse 18. When he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him. God give us some people who beg, to beg, beg to follow Jesus. Yes. Amen. He said he begged him that, that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit it, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has uh, had compassion on you and he departed and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. They probably knew this man was out of it. Family had probably given up. Relatives, people, everybody probably knew him. And he comes walking back into that area talking about Jesus. He says, I was the one out in the tombs. I was the one out there hurting myself. I was a crazy one too far gone and Jesus changed my life. Amen. You see, we are encouraged to be witnesses for Jesus Christ, to share our testimony yes. yep. to those around us. Yep. The Bible says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and unto Silver City, New Mexico. It doesn't say that. It's not the end of the earth, but we can, we can apply it there. Praise the Lord. Amen. Each and every one of us can make impact on the lives of those around us yes. through our testimony. Yes. You know what the problem is? Is we sell ourselves short. We don't think we have what it takes to share you know, with others that might be worse off than ourselves. You know, I have five daughters. The only problem they really have in life is a drug problem. I drug them to church all the time. I drug them to outreach. But then, when, you know, as they were growing older, you know, they would tell me, you know, they would open up, they'd share their personal struggle with me. So, Dad, I can't relate to a girl who's, who's pregnant and doesn't have a boyfriend and she's 14. Because I ain't never been that. I can't relate to somebody who's done drugs, who's grown up in a broken home. I can't relate to... You know, all those things out there. I've never done that. I, I said, hold on. It's all my daughters. That has nothing to do with it. I, I had explained to them, listen, you in, in your goodness compared to the world, in your innocence compared to the world, still came to a point where you realized that you needed Jesus, that you were a sinner and lost. Come on, Pastor. I said, that right there is a powerful testimony. Yeah. Yeah. I said, that is even better than mine. Because you didn't go that route and still realize you needed Jesus. I said, don't sell yourself short. I said, you got plenty to offer. You're not offering your record of experience. You're offering him Jesus, who is the answer. Because that's aiming for everybody. Jesus told this man, go and share what God has done for you. Why? Because God gets the glory and people get impacted. What a joy. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, all things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. It's our ministry as Christians. In other words, in Christ uh, was reconciling the world to himself, not imputing or not counting uh, people's trespasses against them. And he has given to us the message of reconciliation. That's our testimony in the gospel. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were making his plea through us. We plead with you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The only time will tell how much our witness, our testimony, as it has impacted people's lives around us. You don't know how much weight you really are carrying in your job, your mundane job that you just do today to day. You might just share with them, hey, I went to church and God touched my life. You ought to come. And you don't even know how much that's going to influence or impact them. You know, you know, only time is going to tell. You know, history has it that the, after Jerusalem fell under Nero, you know, there's great persecution against the Jews and also the church. People were fleeing, you know, trying to survive. And they were scattering in different places. It, it is said that this area that uh, the Jews and Christians didn't go to was an area called Decapolis. When they went there, they were well received. And a lot of them trace it back to this unnamed demoniac who went through that 10 city area and testified about Jesus. Amen. So when they were running for their lives, 
the word of God had already made impact through the testimony of one man and it preserved others. Because you never know how much impact you're going to have. I'm telling you. The Bible says that in John 15, I remember reading this as a new convert. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to, and, and, and to bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. What a powerful thing. Jesus even said those things in John 15. I remember it leaped out of the text to me. I said, wow, God chose me. Amen. And he appointed me to bear fruit. Come on. Not just me, but every one of us who's had an encounter with Jesus Christ and are doing our best to serve him. And now that we're saved, we have a God-given purpose to bring glory to God by sharing our testimony and to tell people in any manner we can. The reason I do rap music still to this day is not because I like rap or I'm a hip, cool guy. Okay. No, it was years ago when I saw how effective it was in reaching people on the streets. I said, man, I'm going to do that. I asked my pastor, hey, can I do that? Because I'd much rather do rock and roll. And he said, yeah, go for it. And man, I just the impact it had. I was so overjoyed that I could do something. Made a fool of myself when I first started. But I didn't care. I saw people get touched and impact. And you could be the light of someone who's bound in a tomb, cutting themselves, hurting themselves. They desperately need what you have to offer. And I encourage you to take it to heart this evening. To be a witness for Jesus Christ. We are living in dark, gloomy times. There are people everywhere who need some hope. What better hope is there than Jesus and Jesus in your testimony? Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to bow your heads this evening. Heads are bowed or eyes are closed. Just for a moment. Maybe you've come tonight and I don't know your background. I don't know what you've been through or what you're going through. But I can tell you one thing for sure. And that is that Jesus Christ loves you so much that he died on a cross to bear your sins, your guilt, your shame, your addictions, your brokenness, and he took it to the cross. And you can be free if you simply acknowledge, one, that you're a sinner and lost, and two, that he's died for you and he rose again from the dead. If you could do that, you could have a brand new life. Maybe that's you in this place. You had an encounter with Jesus, or you know a little bit about the Bible, but right now you are lost. You say, preacher, I don't care about anybody else. I need Jesus to break the chains on my life. I need to be set free from sin and bondage, depression, all these things that are accumulated in my life. Uh, I need Christ. Would you pray? You lift your hand. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Amen. You be honest between you and the Lord. Thank you. Put your hand down. Maybe you're here and you're backslidden. What's that mean? Backslidden. That means at one time you were making progress, but then you took your eyes off of him and the Bible says the backslider is filled with his own ways. Started, amen, making a decision based on how you felt and what you wanted to do. And you find yourself, uh, amen, not where you should be, backslider. You lift your hand. I need to come back to the Lord. God bless you, sir. Hallelujah. I want these tonight that have lifted their hand. I'm not here to embarrass anybody. If you lifted your hand, always look at me. Did you meant that? You meant that? Would you stand and come forward? I'd be glad to, amen, have someone pray with you at this altar. If you don't mind, would you mind that? God bless you for being honest. Amen. It's okay. Uh, maybe I can get a couple of guys. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Joe, God bless you. Amen. We're going to have somebody pray with these. Uh, amen. And while these are praying, we're not here to put anybody in advance. Anybody. Maybe you didn't lift your hand and you you realize, you know, I need to pray too. Yep. Uh, so I'm so glad I had the opportunity to minister this week. Amen. And I'm believing God for great things in the future. I appreciate the yes. hospitality of Pastor yes. Edna. Amen. Uh, Amen. I believe in God for some good things. I appreciate the offering as well. My family and I, we can't amen, do what we do without amen, the kingdom of God and all that takes place. And so I am grateful and looking forward to seeing and hearing some good things in the future. Let's give the Lord a shout as Pastor comes. God, amen. God met with us again tonight. Amen. 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 Thank God for these who respond to the gospel, the word, the powerful word preached tonight. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Yes. So we're gonna we're gonna keep on serving Jesus. Amen. So we'll our next services are Sunday morning, 1030, uh, 630 in the evening, our evening service. We have church here three times a week because you know, as as we have learned over the years. 
And we don't need less church. We need more church. Amen. 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 And so we'll be here uh, Sunday morning. We start at 930 with our adult Sunday school and then uh, two, two uh, church services. And so I just encourage you, you come back. You give your life to Christ tonight. You tell somebody about Jesus. Tell tell what the Lord has done for you, just like that guy in the story that that uh, that Pastor talked about. Amen. And uh, and God will God will use your testimony to bring others to Christ. Amen. And so as we dismiss tonight, I just uh, again I want to uh, give a word of thanks to everybody who is helping support the work here online. And uh, tonight we received a love offering for for the evangelist. And so if you want to give to that, you can go to the uh, to the door, uh, the door silvercity, uh, dot com, and uh, and donate online on our website. We're posting all the sermons, so those will be there available as well, uh, so you can hear the whole revival this week. Amen. And so we're blessed to be together. So let's uh, let's pray together. Let's ask God's blessing as we dismiss. You let uh, Brother Mike know how much you appreciate his ministry. Otto, would you close us in prayer? Father, we thank you for the blessing of deliverance, Lord God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you can set us free by the power and the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, Brother Mike uh, bringing words of encouragement, strengthening us, Lord yes. God, give us in, giving us a vision for what you are about to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen